have the record video. There we go. The I got it. So we're recording. Perfect. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, my name's Nicole, and I work doing outreach for the film. Um, I'm going to moderate this panel tonight. Um, I'm going to handle the technical aspects of Zoom and field audience questions for the panel discussion. So first, I'm just going to provide some brief Zoom instructions. Um, this panel is being recorded, just so everyone knows. Um, to ask a question to the panel, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. You're free to use the chat box to um, chat amongst each other, but if you want a question specifically posed to the panel, please use the Q&A box because it will probably get lost in the chat box um, and I won't be able to find it if you put it there. Um, when typing your question, if you know who you want to pose it to specifically, please indicate that. If it's just a general question for anyone, that is okay too, and I will um, try to direct those to the appropriate person. Um, if you want to be brought on camera to ask your question, please indicate um, like in a parentheses next to your question, yes, um, and we will bring you on camera with the rest of the panel. Um, if you'd like to remain anonymous in the chat box or the Q&A box, you're free to change your name um, and use a pseudonym or something like that. Um, I'm not going to be reading anyone's name when I ask questions of the panel from the Q&A box. And we aren't going to um, ever post anything from the Q&A box or the chat box anywhere publicly. Um, we may, however, take this recording of the panel discussion and upload it to our film's YouTube channel. So if you do indicate yes that you want to come on camera, obviously you'll be recorded and that may be made public. Um, now I'm just going to read something from Peer Apocalypse. Peer Apocalypse asks participants to please honor the conference comfort agreements found on page six of your conference program. If at any time you need peer support, please visit www.peerpocalypse.com for a list of the on-call peer support specialists or the David Romfrey Oregon Warm Line. Um, now I'm gonna turn things over to Lynn Cunningham. She is one of our filmmakers. She will introduce herself and also briefly tell you who the panelists are today. Um, while the panelists are going around and introducing themselves, please go ahead and start posing your questions in the Q&A box so that I can start asking questions of the panelists um, once they've all introduced themselves. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. I'm Lynn Cunningham, uh, co-director, co-producer of Medicating Normal. And thank you so much for coming tonight and talking with us about this film. That's our most favorite part. Um, and the film began as a personal quest to help a struggling family member. Um, she was a scholar athlete who 10 years after graduating from college was taking 10 prescribed psychiatric drugs daily. Um, she could not hold down a job and she watched hopelessly as her classmates excelled in their careers. And every day she called to ask, is everything going to be okay? And, um, you know, I, I loved her so much that I, I would always answer emphatically, of course, we love you. And no matter what, we will support you. Um, after a while, I real, realized my answers were not exactly what she was looking for. Um, it, was, it, it was not that she was talking about her material needs. Uh, it, she was more talking about regaining her agency her ability to be the high functioning individual that she, she'd been before her 10 years of treatment. Um, and I felt I, in order to help her, I needed to know, to know more about what she was putting into her body. And what I learned inspired the making of the film. Um, my filmmaking partner, Wendy and I read, uh, discovered a treasure trove of online support groups, books, published studies, unpublished studies, uh, Robert Whitaker's um, anatomy of an epidemic, and we began to meet survivors, peers, leaders, experts in the movement, um, um, who all began to help us put, put this puzzle together. Um, we interviewed hundreds of former patients suffering from what 
they perceived to be harm from psychiatric drugs. Each story, like Angie's, moved us deeply, and we knew then that what had been, I knew then that what had begun as a personal quest had really turned into a mission to tell this story. It's not the whole story, and we acknowledge that there are many other legitimate perspectives out there, um, and many people feel they benefit from these drugs. But this particular story was not being told, and we knew that we had to find a way to get it told. Um, as I said before, the dialogue afterwards is really, really important um, because that's where we learn and we keep learning. It isn't a subject that is over. It's a subject that needs to be talked about and um, with everybody involved. Um, so uh, I want Angie to, to explain to you later. She said eloquently after one screening, um, you know, it's having all these voices in one room that safely move this conversation to places it's never been. And that's, that's what I hope you guys will do tonight. And I would like to extend a huge thank you to our panelists, Jessica Carroll, Bronwyn Franklin, Kevin Fitz, and Angela Peacock. Jessica is a citizen of the Osage Nation and is the director of Peer Link and the Optic State Peer Training Program Manager. Bronwyn Franklin is the keynote speaker of Peer Apocalypse 2020 a peer specialist and a mental health advocate, board member of the National Coalition on Mental Health Recovery. Kevin Fitz is the executive, executive director of the Oregon Mental Health Consumers Association. And Angela Peacock is a peer support group co-facilitator for Wounded Warrior Project and is as one of the subjects in the film. And a huge thank you to Nicole Lamberson, our moderator tonight, who is also an integral part of our Medicating Normal outreach team. So let us start to, we, 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 let's start talking and we welcome all your questions. Are we, is anyone else going to introduce themselves or was that the formal introduction? Oh, no, I would, no I would, excuse me, I want you all to introduce yourselves a little bit more and, and briefly talk about your impressions of the film. Bronwyn. Okay. Um, well, yeah. Um, my name is Bronwyn Franklin, and I have been a peer certified peer support specialist for probably 13 years. Um, certified in Washington State, Oregon, and Michigan. I currently reside in uh, Oak Park, Michigan. Um, I resonated with a lot of the stories that I heard in this film. Um, a lot of the stories around the different med changes and the whole um, horror story of that. And currently, I've been off medication for six years. Jessica. Hi, everybody. My name is Jessica Carroll, and I am the director of Peerlink National Technical Assistance Center at Mental Health and Addiction Association of Oregon. Um, I really enjoyed this film. You know, uh, I also have a master's degree in clinical or in counseling psychology. So it's very interesting to understand that, like, we learn talk therapy, right? And when I heard that there was a therapist who was trying to push medication that um, uh, I, I felt a certain kind of way about that. That's not necessarily what therapists are supposed to be doing. Um, but I definitely identified I've had some issues with antipsychotic and sleep medication as well myself. And I really identify with hearing what the doctor says and, and listening to what the doctor says and trusting what the doctor says. Um, I'm not so trusting anymore. Thank you. Kevin. Oh, you've got to turn on your audio. Uh, hi, can you hear me now? Yeah, good. My, so my name is Kevin and I uh, had my, as a individual consumer of psychiatric medication, had my first experience with psychiatric medication when I was 19 years old, when I went AWOL from the United States Army training in Fort Lee, Virginia, under what was termed to me by the medical professionals as a psychotic break. And so had my first experience with um, psychiatric diagnosis, 
and psychiatric medication, and that was in 1984. Um, since 1988, um, when I um, uh, when I have not been challenged with uh, uh, health issues, I've worked as an individual advocate, and most recently for the last uh, 10 years doing system political advocacy, particularly on the state and regional level around initiatives uh, that promote consumer choice, um, that um, respect the idea that what science suggests about what informed consent looks like, and to the best that I'm able to attempt to help steer folks to projects like the Inner Compass Project, the writings of Robert Whitaker. The, there was a lot of stuff in the film I'm quite familiar with. I've been to conferences where Robert Whitaker has spoke. I've had so many friends go back and forth from the merry-go-round of getting off psychiatric medications, cold turkey, and having tremendous challenges and going back on, moving to street drugs. I've had four friends that got caught in that merry-ground and ended their life. And I have a, a huge amount of friends that are currently on psychiatric medications, particularly benzodiazepines and antidepressants. And the challenge, I want, I mean, in my heart, I wanna be able to believe that everybody who feels like they wanna make a change um, and wanna choose that route for them, that that's possible. But I've seen so many people, particularly younger women, uh, in their, you know, in their mid-teens to their early 30s, attempt to get off antidepressants and how challenging that process is for them. Not, uh, not just finding a medical professional or a therapist to support them, but just the physiological changes that, go, that they go through that on friends of mine has affected their menstruation, it's affected them grinding their teeth, their sleep cycles, their moods, it's, some of that has been horrendous. And one of my best friends uh, in 1993 was going through this with some of the earlier antidepressants and, and ended up um, suiciding. So, uh, and I have a whole myriad of friends, probably 10 or 15 friends in the last 20 years who have suicided and tried that back and forth, back and forth. And also too, I should say the challenge is where is a map for people who are a trusted authority around the experience of negative or hard feelings or hard thoughts? And there's not really a roadmap except to the dominant paradigm, and that's the house of psychiatry. Uh, and I'm not here to say that some of these medications don't help with certain symptom management, but I think there's also a significant amount of science that suggests these things have significant consequences on our living organs and the challenge and the retractability that they have on your being trying to go off them can be really a nightmare of its own. So thank you. Nicole, you want, so I guess we're open. Angie. Angie. Oh, me, I have to introduce myself. Sorry. <laughs> I was listening to Kevin. Okay. I'm Angie. I, I was in the film. I just recently graduated with a master's in social work. I decided not to practice because I just found it to be a lot of things that I was not driving with ethically because of my own lived experiences. So I'm definitely um, on the peer spectrum with, with respect to other fellow veterans. And I don't know what else to say. I'm four and a half years off of medications. They gave me over 40 psychiatric drugs. I still have a lot of severe symptoms that I live with daily and very little validation besides things like the film and having these awesome conversations and being able to talk about it openly. So I just look forward to hearing from all of you. Okay, so just a reminder, if you're just tuning in, if you um, have questions for the panel, please put them in the Q&A box. And if you wanna come on camera, put yes in parentheses next to your question. Um, I guess, Lynn, we can start with um, an easy one for you. Somebody wants to know, is the film available to the public? And when and where will it be available? Well, currently the film, we're doing exactly what we're doing right now. Um, and that is, well, it would, it would be in um, person, but, and in uh, community centers across the country. But now we're, we're doing the same thing virtually. Um, it's, 
we're, we reach out to all of you, the people who are right here tonight, if you know of groups of people who will benefit, who need to talk about this, who want to talk about it, who know nothing about it, who know quite a bit about it, all of the above, um, that we're calling them community screenings. And um, we, we have a list of them on our website. And please contact us and just uh, request a screening and we will um, send you um, helpful hints on how to organize and we really enjoy the partnership and um, every time we do it and I said this before we learn so much so that's what we're doing now uh, we're about to um, engage in, a, in a, a contract with a European distributor um, Europe is in many ways a little bit ahead of us ahead of the US more open um, and that then in the fall, we hope to do a U.S. educational distributor because, again, we really want to get our film into universities, schools, med schools, um, and eventually after that, we will move into the online streaming so that you guys can all see it. And we don't know where. I mean, we'd love to have it on Netflix, but there are many other venues. So we will keep you posted, and um, you will help us, we hope. Okay, so um, the next question is two people sort of asked or played off each other. The first part of the question is, I'm wondering what we can do about this issue. For example, is there any legislative action we can support organizations to support? Um, I see Kevin has been putting some organizations in the chat box. And then the second person said, Ditto, could legislative reforms facilitate a return to authentic peer review? Would this include a review of marketing laws as well as a third party research evaluation for profit driven research and analysis? Does anybody want to take that one? Kevin, why don't you? I can share a little bit um, about the benzodiazepine issue in particular. There's a I'm actually a, a board, like a volunteer with them. It's Benzodiazepine Information Coalition. And there are several states that have filed informed consent laws. And we are so careful because we don't want people to be ripped off of these medications overnight, right? So it's just like before you get put on it in the first place, you would be told like these are not supposed to be used longer than two to four weeks. You could have severe withdrawal effects, things like that. So there is like Colorado, Massachusetts is the closest right now. Uh, New Jersey has filed a law. So there are state laws. And then I worked a little bit on the Department of VA with veterans because the scary part is that we have the highest level of healthcare access. Like anytime we need anything, we just go to the doctor and we get it and we don't have to pay for it or anything. So, but we also have the highest rate of suicide, which is pretty interesting. So um, I've tried to work on that angle and it's, it's almost like I'm speaking a foreign language. Like they're not ready to hear it. They're not ready to hear that, you know, the, the common narrative is throw money at mental health and it'll fix the problem. But look where we are. We have the highest rates of disability. We have the highest rates of suicide. So the question, it has to be big, which is the basis of Robert Whitaker's work is if our meds and treatments are so great, why is, why are so many of us so sick for so long? You know, anybody else? Well, we can, we can talk about, I mean, I think it's on a state by state basis. We had a wonderful screening um, in July where uh, one of our attendees brought his best friend who just happened to be the executive director of the Colorado, of public health in Colorado. And she was so excited. She wanted the governor to see the film. She um, had a committee of her coworkers see the film. And um, I think it's just, it is, it's the, again, it was in the discussion afterwards too, where a, a bunch of psychiatrists were there who were nodding their heads, a GP. Um, the big theme on her, the worry on her part was how can I, um, how can we get some of some alternatives up on, on as, as options that are covered by insurance? And this was a big struggle and they can't cover alternatives with insurance unless they're scientifically proved them to work. So where are the studies on all the alternatives? And believe it or not, there are some studies on alternatives on um, meditation and the importance of sleep and exercise. Um, 
but it was just good to get the dialogue going. And in Pennsylvania, I think hope, hoping something similar will be happening. But I think that it starts with all of us just talking to each other and writing our politicians and um, keeping the dialogue going. Angie or Kevin, do either of you want to list off some organizations to support? I can't hear you, Kevin. Kevin, I think you're right. There you go. Um, so in Oregon, we have a population of 4 million people. Um, right here in Portland, the major metropolitan area, the School of Psychiatry is right up, you know, in the in Portland and it trains psychiatrists that go to work in our community mental health systems and our commercial systems across the state and mostly across the region. And so the so here is the challenge. We have a legislature of 90 individuals and the in even even as a high school dropout, I can tell you there's significant science that backs up a significant amount of things that this that the film was saying, not alarmist but just sort of straightforward object, objective science. Here's the challenge. We have a psychiatric establishment that is basing an awful lot of their treatment protocols on stuff that was basically 1970s theory. And so here is the challenge. We have also, like we have, you know, we're a smaller state. We have a state legislature that is dominated by for-profit uh, commercial health agencies, significant influence by the pharmaceutical company and their desire for not us not to regulate them, for us not to cap them. And the here's the challenge. So, so say that I'm a one note Johnny advocate and I want to change informed consent at the legislature. Say that I'm also working on peer respite and I'm also working on um, other projects. And I come forward and attempt to, with no funding or very little budget, to try to raise these issues of the science. Um, where am I in collaboration with the family movement or, um, or industry organizations on all these other goals that we support? Um, and then there is reflexively, and I hate to say it, particularly in our most liberal legislators who uh, on a lot of issues I very much value, but the whole idea of civil, civil rights and informed consent for people that they see as having a label that I do or a psychiatric diagnosis of schizophrenia or severe suicidal depression, the whole idea of choice is not mine to make. It's the public safety or the family member. Um, one thing is that I want to just put in your uh, hat to think about, uh, please watch the struggle that Kanye West is going through with his own challenges about what he defines as what his experience is, what his family and his handlers. Um, uh, there's an in conventional pop culture. It is almost reflexively, Sally is off a rocker because she did not take her meds. Now, whether we challenge that assumption and think that's not actually true, maybe there are other issues. Maybe Sally's off a rocker because the meds gave her a rebound psychosis when she tried to get off of them because they were giving her metabolic disease, interfering with sexual function or whatever. So the challenge is how do we move forward? I mean, the biggest challenge we have, and I appreciate Lynn so much in putting documentary as a form of social justice out there, is that we need a bigger crowd. We need uh, a bigger audience, a customer base to come together, knitted together in unity around this issue. Because if not, we're gonna be pushed over into the anti-vax and that we're not psychiatrists and we're not practicing science. And then we get marginalized but we're also trying to move through a whole bunch of other humane initiatives. Um, so I think that's the biggest challenge. And, and I think, and again, thank you so much. I, fi I find documentary film is a powerful form of education and, and uh, igniting social, social justice. Thank you, Donald. And I agree with a lot of what Kevin said, but I think our biggest problem is how do we get big farms money out of the pocket of our legislators who are making the laws who are allowing this 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 box to go this broken system to continue? You heard we heard in the film. There's no one you can sue. You can't sue the psychiatrist. You can't sue the pharmacy company. The and FDA is allowing these this false data to go through, and they're approving these these four week trials and putting this medication out here that's causing suicide 
um, organ organ failure for some of us and and psychosis for some of us i think the big problem is how do we get a handle on big farm who has all this big money that's throwing it into our legislature into our government into their pockets by by way of 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 their campaigns there's big bucks being passed into those campaigns so that that can assure that when certain laws or legislatures or whatever comes up they there it's going to be in their favor how do we stop that that's what i would like to see yeah and can i just say that to me this all comes back to the stigma of feeling different right it's uh you talked about it really well in the in the movie when you talk about like we've kind of changed what normal is right normal is a whole range of feelings it's a whole range of experiences and when we can other people who have a different experience then we can allow pharmaceutical companies and and people without uh uh goodness in their heart to do these things right you know like when we when we think about people with mental health issues and i know when i think about myself for so long i was that person in the street that nobody cared about nobody cared if a if a pharmaceutical company was giving me drugs that were going to make me sick nobody cared about that you know and that's what stigma is and i really feel like when we can finally start to make some headway in the stigma then people can start to see us as people, right? And start to treat us as such. Um, the next question is, I had read that New Zealand and the United States of America are the only two countries that allow drug companies to advertise. Um, I think they're talking about direct to consumer advertising. Do you think the USA will ever change this or is the money from pharma too strong? I mean, we just pretty much it. the whole system is pretty rigged, you know? So. Yeah, I, 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 I totally agree. Um, I think big farm is too strong. Their dollars go a long, long way. They're doing trillions of dollars a, a year and they, they're able to pass some of it out to um, the powers that is in control of causing uh, the loss. So, and I think what Jessica said is, is huge. It makes, a, it makes a sense. If we're able to be recognized as intelligent and human because they see us as we're these sick people who can't think for ourselves, um, we're incapacitated, so they, they can make laws and choices for us. If they can see us in a way that we are human, we are thinking, we are intelligent, we can, we can get master's degrees and doctor degrees, and we can do these things. We, they need to start seeing that. But we come from a society that is all about capitalism, even though this is supposed to be America. It's the almighty dollar that rules. Yeah, if you look at the amount of money they pay in fines already, billions and billions of dollars, like, yeah. One point is, and I've been, Mr. Whitaker kind of touched upon it a little bit, and this is a story that I was told by a mentor of mine in the early 80s, the psychiatric medical journals were having a tremendous, hardly hard time paying for printing, distribution, and they got a blessing in disguise or what they thought was the pharmaceutical company started coming in with the innovations of Prozac and Zoloft and those sort of things. And, and it was almost a, a deal made with, you know, with the pharmaceutical companies and the medical science, psychiatric science journals, you know, we'll help underwrite these, uh, but uh, we are going to give you bad news or we're going to cause you grief if there are things in here that uh, that negatively affect the sell sales of our pills. The challenge is, and I've heard it, you know, we're in a conference of 550 peers. I've heard 10 times today, people say this is evidence-based, like what I'm doing, you know, I'm washing my dishes, you know, in an evidence-based way. I'm following my psychiatrist's prescription because it's evidence-based. 
And the challenge is, is you, to try to go back to the genesis of, well, what does this science look like? And, um, and are we really getting some understanding of some of these studies? And, and Whitaker in his book, Mad in America, talks about some of the studies they, they had looking at Zyprexa, an antipsychotic early on. They actually buried some of those studies because they didn't want the public or the your customer base to know about some of them. So it's a significant, and I totally agree with Bronwyn. Uh, if we had the capital, if we had you know the money that Elon Musk does or or Buffett, we could rent some billboards and we could start uh, connecting uh, you know a tribe and a community of people who all have sort of the same volition um, and to counter their powerful financially backed voice with a community grassroots voice does take some some networking, some community organization, and some funds. Okay. How do you suggest we help our peers who are maybe going through the same things as Angela? I ask because it is out of my scope because I'm not a doctor, but I do want to help anyone in any way possible when it comes to this. Jessica, do you want to, since you're a, like a peer trainer, will you hit that one first? Yeah, I think when it comes to peer support, man, you know, we have to remember that choice is numero uno, right? And so if, if and I've had uh, peers who were on some medications that like will take Zyprexa, for instance, right? I had a really bad experience with Zyprexa and then I had my psychiatrist look at me and tell me, well, it's just because you're fat. That's what he said. Um, you know, and it couldn't, it couldn't be the medication. So I have some really strong feelings about Zyprexa. And I think a lot of us have a lot of strong feelings about medications. And when we're supporting our peers, we have to understand that we came to these ideas and we, we came to these conclusions on our own, right? Down our own path. And I just think, like, when it comes down to it, like, we want to ensure that we're not creating shame in people who are taking medication right? Because shame is the killer of everything. And if we're going to be anti anything, let's be anti shame. Oh, so my answer to that question, sorry, my answer to that question is, you know, supporting and walking alongside your peers, no matter what their decision is, is of the utmost importance. And I would just say, I'm, I'm going to put myself in back in my shoes 10 years ago. Uh, when I was on like 16 medications at the same time. Um, nobody ever even t talked about this. I went and got a bachelor's degree in psychology. It took me eight years to finish my degree because I was so medicated and I was on a plan like through voc rehab where the doctor said I couldn't take more than two classes um, a semester. And I just wish someone would have said something. And you heard me say it in the film, like I went to all these doctors and therapists and all this stuff. Nobody ever said anything. So I'm all about like, like she said, you know, not to create shame, but I just wish someone would have said like, have you read the pamphlets? Have you checked your drug interactions? Have you talked to your pharmacist? Like just do a safety check. You know, the one thing that Nicole always says that I steal from her <laughs> is that like we read the Amazon reviews. When you buy something on Amazon or you buy a new car, you read the reviews, right? So why don't we do that for psych drugs? I don't know. But I wish, I mean, it could have saved me 13 years of suffering and withdrawal if a peer would have said that to me. I might have been open to something, you know, so not to create shame, but to provide information so that I could have made a better choice. And maybe I would not be here four and a half years off, like still suffering from neurological damage from long term care and then the trauma of trying to come off of it, you know. I agree with both of you. Um, the shame is, 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 is hard for me as a peer support specialist. And I talk about it when I do trainings as well. I, I Informed consent is huge and we don't get that. When we're prescribed these medications and even when we go in the pharmacy and they say, we're gonna give you a consultation and they, they say, have you ever taken this medication before? But, but they don't really tell you about the side effects. So when I'm working with someone and it's in, and they bring up their medication, I don't, I don't deal in, I don't ask those type of questions. But then when they bring it up, I do ask the question, have you read the side effects? Have you Googled this and looked in, and researched this? Have you been here, there, and other places? 
that and I asked them and then I asked them, well, what questions do you have for your doctor? Let's sit down and write those down. When you go into the doctor's office, let's ask those questions. You may not get the answer you want to hear or you might not get the right answer, but at least you ask the question because now your doctor is thinking that maybe there's something to what's going on with you because questions trigger the mind. It makes us think. So I ask the questions and I encourage them to ask the questions. And you know, it just kind of deviates a little bit. The DSM-5, anybody that's ever took a training with me and I've talked about it, I will tell them. I don't like the book. I've never read the book. I don't open the book. I don't encourage my peers to get into the DSM-5 because me, I don't like labels. So how are you going to put a label on me when you've never walked in my shoes or had my experience? So the film hit that on the head and I was sitting over here going, Yay! <laughs> because it was the DSM-5 trash. I want to say one more thing though. When you learn all this information, I mean, I, this is what I did. Like, go, you want to tell everybody and be like, oh my God, do you know that the meds are so dangerous and they'll kill, you know, all this, like you get excited, but listen, even a guy in the film, I don't want to breach like his privacy or anything, but when he found all this information, he was just so upset. Like you mean, I mean, and I had my own experience, like I was lied to, oh my God, maybe I'm not as mentally ill as they made me out to be, you know, it's like your brain blows up when you find this out, you know? So I just want to encourage everyone, do not, like whatever you do, please do not abruptly stop any medication because of what you learned today or tell someone else to do that because I am suffering so bad from the way that the doctor took me off the medication so quickly. And um, I know like hundreds of people that are in the same boat. So yes, this information is important and valuable and should be shared without shame, but also you have to educate yourself about tapering and do it safely and slowly and do not make yourself worse because I mean it can cause suicide and all kinds of stuff and we don't want that to happen you know so just want can, to I, can I just say that as peers you know this is where we can come in and help our folks advocate at their doctor's offices and say and and learn about the side effects of their drugs and help them do that research so they can have they can be informed you know, and then they get to make that decision and whatever that decision is, whether it's us supporting them in their doctor's appointments or us supporting them to find those, the, you know, the uh, guide to the harm reduction guide to getting off, you know, psychiatric medication and doing that research, like whatever that is, we're just there to support them in their decisions and help them be, you know, um, to have, uh, to be more informed. I just wanted to add one thing that Ivan told me, the pharmacist in the film, he is a great pharmacist, caring, and he's a small pharmacist, so it's not like going into a CVS or something. He really does know his clients, um, but he, he advises them whenever, you know, he's seen everything, and he advises them to keep a small journal, to write down exactly what they feel and when, you know, when they took the med, after how much food, what it made them feel, not just one day, but day after day so that when they eventually get back to their doctor's office they actually have documentation which is really important to a doctor because if you can just specifically say and look at some written stuff that is going to get the doctor's attention much more than if you say something like oh i don't really feel great i don't really so ivan says write it down and um and i and i'm, I'm sure peers say that too to one another which is um helpful but it's very intimidating going into a doctor. That that scene of I of um, Shalimar's doctor after we really really didn't want to have him be you know disguised. We wanted him to come out and allow him that scene to be shown. And so we got our courage up to go to him. And just walking into a doctor's office made our you know we were shaking going in there and. He wasn't even our doctor, but this sort of power thing starts to come in and you get really intimidated and anything you thought you remembered of is gone. So that's why I think what Ivan says is really good. Write it down, it's right there. And um, yeah, so that's helpful hint from Ivan.
Um, in light of the severe side effects of withdrawal, what types of economic, psychosocial, and or social supports were most necessary in processing withdrawal over the lengthy duration? Also, is the exponential tapering formula created by Dave available for examination or individual replication? Um, I have a lot to say I'm about sure that. I'm sure Dave would, would share it, but it is a basic mathematical formula called exponential, and it's not 10%, it's 10% of the dose you just took, essentially. Right, Angie? Well, I mean, some people do 5 to 10% every two to four weeks. Some people do 2%. Some people do 1% a month. It's all an individual choice. But I would say for, uh, for taper plans, there's two, there's two um, websites that are peer support. One is called survivingantidepressants.org. The other one is Benzo Buddies Forum. You'd have to just Google it to find it. There's also, uh, Kevin put in the comment section, the chat section, but people that view this later won't be able to see that. So there's Intercompass Initiative. The Withdrawal Project is their project, and Nicole actually helped um, write all the material for that website, and it's been reviewed by pharmacists and everything. Awesome. But there's also the Harm Reduction Guide to um, Tapering Off Psychiatric Drugs by Will Hall. So there's a bunch of resources out there. Um, I've seen people post, like, can you help me with the taper plan? There's um, support groups on Facebook if you type in a drug name, but those are being censored right now. So if you type in Benzo, you probably won't find them. But um, there's lots of groups that do that. And for me, from my personal experience, because I've been off four and a half years now, the only thing that has helped me, the only thing has been peer support for people that have gone through this, who've come off of it. When I can call them with all my crazy symptoms and feeling like I should be dead because it's just, I just, I've felt so bad from coming off of the meds. Like they are there to reassure me and to say it's temporary and you're going to get better and you just have to keep going. I mean, I've faced nothing but like invalidation and gaslighting every time I try to talk to a medical professional about any of my symptoms. And it almost causes more trauma because you're like, I can't, nobody believes you. Like yep. they don't believe that you like talk about stigma. You're saying I have a mental health diagnosis. I came off my meds and four and a half years later, I still have symptoms like that stigma. Like nobody believes you. But as you can see in the film, like the film believes us and you know, thank God that Lynn and Wendy have elevated our stories to be heard you know, but there's a lot of people like us and really peers is what got me through. I just want to add to that. I've been off since to uh, uh, November, 2014. Um, having, I, I, people always ask me why, you know, why aren't you doing this more politically? Why aren't you lobbying for this? Um, there's an old axiom called the rising tide lifts all boats. I really believe that consequentially, the larger the peer uh, movement grows and helping uh, make community connections for folks who are suffering just as a informal information network and knowing people who have gone this journey and that journey was instrumental in mine. I mean, also, fortunately, I've worked in this field or so-called field for, you know, on and off 30 years. Um, and it has been my peers who have been down that road and also my peers who have tolerance for extreme uh, challenges of mood and thoughts and experiences that uh, came out of some of the withdrawal process, um, particularly. I also want to say also about Angie, when I first got the news that this, that I wanted to go off them and had successfully got off them, I felt like I wanted to tell the world how important this was and to tell all the people that I know, you know, who are taking these, um, and it reminded me of a friend told me about the parable of the person with eyesight when they wander into the Valley of the Blind and thinking that they have new information to put to that culture. And within a week, they're saying, remove those eyeballs or we're going to excommunicate you. And sometimes in the advocacy community, when I've seen people pick up this particular issue singularly, they get labeled as a Scientologist or an anti-science person or uh, non-medical professional that um, so the challenge I think is finding people who can support you people who have been through such a process and don't put a whole lot of musts and shoulds and are not going to uh, desert you as a friend if you decide the course for you is to stay on such medications or return to them um, uh, you know it's a it's a we're in our infancy and in trying to understand how to cross network 
and support each other without the blessing of the medical industry, um, you know, for the large part. So. Uh, the next question, I often attend medical mental health appointments with individuals I serve. Any suggestions or questions to ask to encourage informed consent conversation between prescribers, providers, and those we serve? I'm not intimidated by medical model providers, just not sure how to support and in sparking informed consent dialogue. I received so much pushback attempting conversation when I decided to eliminate medication that I stopped cold turkey one year later, still carrying side effects. That was just a comment, not a question. Uh, I think the question is, any suggestions or questions to ask to encourage informed consent conversation between prescribers and those we serve? So this person is going to doctor's appointments with other people. I mean, I always love the, the advice to ask, you know, what is the exit plan? Is this drug meant to be taken forever or is it supposed to help me get from this situation to this situation? and just see what, what the doctor says on that one. I think I like going back to the idea of using the journaling and also um, having the, asking the, having the, the, the person that they're serving, you know, just having that dialogue between themselves and, and writing it down if they have to write it out in the script, you know, for that, that, that person to be able to ask the prescriber those right questions because I had a doctor tell me that, oh, you're going to be on medication the rest of your life, you know, and he was increasing the dose when he was telling me that, you know, and here I am, I've been off six years now. So you have to, you have to, you have to dive deeper and yet you're going to get pushed back, but sometimes you just have to be, be that squeaky wheel, keep asking the questions over and over and over again. I would just, Oh, Jessica, you go, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, so um, I had a lot of success with doing role plays with my peers, you know, when I was supporting them, like, so, you know, and we would role play both, like the questions that we're going to be asked and what happens when you don't hear what you want to hear from the doctor, because that's reality sometimes, right? And I think if you go in with like expecting that, hey, I'm gonna use my voice and the doctor's gonna hear me and then the doctor doesn't hear you, it's, it can be crushing, right? So also understanding that there are other doctors in this world and there are actually some pretty good ones. You know, I have a really good doctor right now and um, we don't always have to stick with the one that, you know, we're allotted. And I, I just wanted to say the like, this is basic health literacy that unfortunately we're not ever taught that we just supposed to trust whatever the doctor says and just go with what they say. But part of, I, I would think part of recovery should be like, what do I think? What do I want to take? What's good for me? What do I want to do? Like, what are my goals? So I would put that back on like this, you know, you're, you have autonomy still. So try to use it as best you can don't just like what i did was hand my power over and let them do whatever they wanted to me like it was disastrous um there was a section of the video explaining how quickly urges change when it comes to suicidal thoughts moving into suicidal behaviors what do you feel helps people get through these moments and struggles short term and in the long term as well Ooh, that's hot. That's a hot topic. Um, I can just tell you, there was four times that I was suicidal on meds and they were all due to either stopping, starting or changing a med or increasing a dose. And one of the times it was so, I, I was like, I was in like some other state of mind. I was like in the car with the um, garage door closed with my dog. And it was like, I didn't even know what I was doing. And I kept doing this and I was, I didn't really even know what I was doing was bad. And then just one day I'm like, Angie, what do you do? You're going to die like in the garage. You cannot do that. And then I told the psychiatrist and they said, oh, well, we just doubled your dose of Lyrica. So that's probably what it is. Let's take you off of that. So, and then this last time 
I'm not going to get super graphic. I'm sorry, but um, it was just so intense that it literally felt like my body was going to take over and do this thing. And I, I can't explain that. Okay. I just know that it happened to me. And it was something about like, now I learned later that benzodiazepines can harm your inhibition, just like alcohol. So if they, you know, they're like on this, they act on the same part of the brain and their nervous system depressant. So something about my inhibition had been damaged and I knew that I wasn't suicidal. Like I, like I didn't want to die for real. And I'm like, why does my mind, it was almost like it, it went from intrusive thoughts to suicidal thoughts to suicidal urges. And that, I, that my body was just gonna like do it or something. And now as I'm saying this, I feel like it sounds scary and it, it absolutely was, you know? But um, those moments like, and then coming off the meds, I also struggled with it. Um, it was like one second at a time. I'm not kidding. It was brutal. It was terrifying. And at the same time, I was scared to even go to the hospital because I was like, if I go, they're just going to put me on more meds. And like, that's what I'm trying to get away from. And that's what did this to me. And I can't. So I'm sorry for sharing. I don't hope I'm not like oversharing or something, but it's a lot and it's scary and it's intense. But the people in withdrawal that went through it themselves are the ones that helped me. I mean, that's what helped me. So um, for myself, um, similar experiences to Angie. Um, some of mine were basically after coming off of medications. Um, back before I knew better, I was going cold turkey. And um, uh, the last time was pretty, pretty harsh. It was and then I had been misdiagnosed for 20 years. Um, so the medications that they were giving me and they just was increasing doses and I wasn't feeling any better was, you know, you weren't treating the right thing. Um, so the last time I called Turkey, um, it became, I, I became out of control and um, the system is, is, is harsh on, unfortunately, black folks because um, when I went into crisis, um, someone almost died and they sent me to prison for eight and a half years. They didn't send me to the hospital. They sent me to prison and they put, that's where they put me on the benzos. And then that's when they just kept me on the Zoloft. And it was a part of my being compliant to be able to get parole and come home was to stay on those medications. Then when I came home, they added three more medications and it just went on and on and on. Um, now that I have been off and I, I found a great doctor that helped me get off and helped me do natural supplements and, you know, told me things about eating healthier and growing more vegetables and, you know, eating things natural. Um, I still have those, those, those th thoughts sometimes. Um, they come and they go, but sometimes it's one second at a time. But peer support, my peer support community has been my strength through it all. I can reach out or someone will reach out to me and I can have a conversation that will help distract me um, to, to back to a, a, a state of being, having hope again. Um, I also do gratitude. I try to keep a gratitude journal. I try to look at those gratitudes on a daily basis to help me keep from feeling that way. So I, I just do certain things, you know, um, I got a trunk of tools and I use whatever I have to use. And if that one don't work, I throw it to the side and grab another one. Because to be in that place of feeling like you want to completely um, take your life is hard. And you're in some sort of pain and it's, it's, let's address the pain. What's causing that? Um, and sometimes it's just, you just need to talk. I don't know. That's works for me. I just want to share one more thing because the chat box, somebody reminded me that I did have to find a person that I could share those feelings with that was not going to call the police on me. That was safe because unfortunately our system has become, it's punitive to talk about suicide. So if I say I'm suicidal, somebody calls 911, I go to the hospital, a bunch of things can happen. They take me out of my context. They take my clothes. They take my dignity. And is that what I want? I mean, I've been hospitalized seven times. It was never therapeutic for me personally. So I had to find safe people that I could share that stuff with and that, that they knew that like, I don't really want to do it. I'm just having these feelings and I'm scared. And what do I do and talk about it?
Um, this next question is a good follow up to what um, Bronwyn just said. Um, does anyone on the panel have any experience with utilizing a naturopathic doctor or with an herbalist to replace Western psychiatric medication? Any successes or failures? So with myself, it was not a, it was not a naturalist. It was an actual psychiatrist at Kaiser. But, and who wanted to keep giving me lithium and all of these other drugs. And I was like, no, I don't want to be on medication. And he disclosed, and he shouldn't have, but he disclosed that he was um, uh, a consumer himself. And he has all these books in his walls about all these different things. And he's also Asian. So he believed in, in, in some other stuff besides Western medicine. So um, he would help me look at supplements um, and, you know, give me names of different supplements and tell me, research them. And but he would, because of his job, he still would have to give me the prescription for the lithium. I had a choice whether to fill it or not, but he had done his job. Plus, he also had honored what I was asking for. And then I started to see acupuncture and massage therapy and um, just nature on my own because those things help make me feel better. So that's, that's kind of how it, it happened for me. It was actual psychiatrist that helped me make that transition. For me, it wasn't. Uh, uh, I've had. I've gone to naturopaths and um, uh, alternative practitioners as my primary care physician of 15 years. We just got my blood panel back, and we were looking. He was talking about my A1C, my accumulative blood sugar over three three months, and he said, "You know, Kevin, if this continues this trend in your blood sugar, you know, you're currently what uh, I would describe as pre-diabetic." Uh, if you don't make a course correction, I suspect in you know a year or two, you might end up becoming full blown diabetic. And he said, you know, not really sure what's exactly is going on, but you look like you also are struggling, you know, with um, some weight issues. And I said, well, I'm not really sure. It's not like I eat a huge amount. And we started talking about the fact that I was on a significant amount of Zyprexa, and he pulled it out and he read the black box warning, and he said, you know, I don't you know, I've been seeing you for 15 years. Um, you've been taking this, you know, for quite a long time, still having an awful lot of that same symptomology. This is an extremely expensive sleeping pill that also has an awful lot of consequences to your body, to your blood sugar, to your metabolism. Um, why are you taking this? And I said, well, partially because I have a bunch of my family members, particularly my parents, uh, and others who really don't want to see the horrors of me um, you know, having a significant break of extreme states in which I jeopardize my housing, um, uh, et cetera. And he said, well, uh, we should talk about this because if it's, you're having problems with sleep, I don't even think this is particularly appropriate, but this is a pretty heavy load that you're taking and not getting, you know, even the therapy, therapeutic benefit. And he said, you know, it's up to you what you want to do. Um, and he supported me to uh, attempt to titrate off of it. And I started doing that and had a relapse back into aggressive al alcoholism. September 3rd, 19, uh, 2014, I decided I was gonna stop, it was gonna stop my drinking absolutely right at that point. I was gonna go completely cold turkey off my Zyprexa. The next 10 days were acts, were filled with visions of myself, stabbing myself in the eye, jumping into traffic, just, impulsive impulsivity off the table went back to uh, my doctor he said you know let's not try to you know build rome in a day why don't we try to work on you getting off the booze and uh and maintaining some sobriety and we, and i don't know what the ratio that he put me on was we're gonna we're gonna work on titrating you off bit by bit by bit slowly and six months later uh by mid-february 2015 i was completely off of it and so uh but and then since then i've seen practitioners and the main thing that i get is you know did you ever go to a psychiatrist to learn how to feel your feelings or to heal your you know your uh you know your childhood uh 
challenges or your childhood trauma. Uh, not particularly, and never did they set themselves up that way. It was always sort of mental or a philosophical thing we're addressing in symptomology. And they all pointed me, I want you to understand your nervous system and find routes, whether it's breathing or yoga or dance, uh, support groups or whatever, and find something that works for you uh, and get after it. And his encouragement and continued encouragement is the reason why I'm here. Somebody who believed in me and let me sort of look at how I wanted to put the puzzle pieces together for what my future looks like. And I'm still, you know, still experimenting, uh, you know, on different things that help me reset my my trauma and my nervous system so um whenever i bring it up to my non-peer colleagues they say the meds help a majority of the population they believe that it's just a small percentage that have negative effects from the use of prescription meds can we or do we have data that speaks to that David Cohen in, of UCLA believes it's a lot more than a small percentage. Um, I think, and we quoted him in the film, 30 to 35 percent, no, 20 to 25 percent in his experience anecdotally um, love their drugs and think they help. 40 percent don't really, can't really tell whether they're good or bad, but they're, they're, they're not hurting them. And then a good 30 to 35 percent are being harmed. So I don't think that there is data, real scientific data about that, but generally that's what most people feel, that it's about a third, a third, a third. But in, in when we go around the country in these screenings, more people talk about harms like Kevin did. And it takes courage to talk about what you've been through and that you've been harmed. And um, no, I don't think there's data. Angie? Well, look, I think that I want Nicole to answer. Can you talk about it, Nicole? If there's data, um, well, just for the benzodiazepines, I know that the data is so disparate because they haven't actually studied it for long enough, um, like the withdrawal effects. So they'll say, well, uh, there's like four or five different sources and we found anywhere between um, like 30% and 100% of people will get withdrawal from benzodiazepines, taking them for, again, it's, it's different for each study, but they'll say like a month and then maybe the higher percentage, like closer to the 100% of people will have taken them for six months. But really, there's nothing that like nails it down and has said, we have studied these people. We know this percentage is your risk. If you take a benzo for more than two weeks, you're at this risk of having withdrawal. They just don't know because they're not studying the withdrawal mm -hmm. specifically. I just, and I just want to say one thing to that is that like the book, Madam, or I'm sorry, no, Anatomy of an Epidemic by Robert Whitaker. He talks about the long-term risks of the long-term outcomes are not better when they compare people that take drugs long term versus people that have problems but are not taking drugs long term people especially with serious mental illness they die 25 years younger that is harm that's evidence of harm and we and it's so sad like the way our society just writes that off and they i mean i went through social work school and i sat there in the rooms with the professor basically blaming the patient well that's because they smoke and it's because they gain weight and then they get diabetes what do you and then they show the study that says these antipsychotics cause metabolic disorders. It's not the person being lazy. It's not because you can't exercise. You don't feel good. So that is evidence of harm. I mean, I don't know how much more you need, but like Nicole said, they're not studying people in withdrawal. No, they're not. Why would they do that? Anna Lemke spoke to that in the film, kind of. Well, some of these are questions that they don't particularly uh, want to ask also. And also, there are people here on planet Earth that think that the dinosaurs were here 10,000 years ago, and that's when the Earth was created. Although there's plenty of carbon data that suggests, dating that suggests we've been around for a lot longer than that. All the data in the world might not make somebody who has a conviction or a particular posture change your mind, especially when it comes with the entitlement of the role you have as a medical authority in our society. And uh, my initial uh, premise, and I still believe it's true, 
So many psychiatrists that come out of the Oregon Health Sciences University are practicing a theory, some theory idea, something that was passed on to them three or four generations ago that they're passing on as complete science. And I think that that's a challenging thing to do, um, you know, uh, or that's challenging for the patient. I could show people uh, reports that talk about the iatrogenic damage to it, but does it change their mind when reflexively or culturally they think, Kanye's off his meds. He needs to take these meds. Who cares if it's swelling his cranium and slowing down his neuronal process and giving him, you know, a pair, you know, uh, an apple size sort of, you know, mid midsection. Uh, some of these instincts that popular culture have around what it's like to be seriously mentally ill and what the course of treatment is. You know, that's it's to try to challenge that is is significant and and uh uh hard i think and just always remember who's doing the research right yeah also there's just patient groups with hundreds of thousands of patients that are trying to get off meds and suffering those are will be evidence one day if somebody took it upon you know to read it and lastly the fda MedWatch database people report suicide, homicide, severe, you know, metabolic disorders, but apparently the FDA is not reading all the consumer reports of people reporting adverse drug reactions. Okay, um, so I'm conscious of the time. I know we've all just watched a full movie and then we've been doing this almost an hour. So I think we'll do two more questions. Um, this one, I was put on Ambien for sleep and I did a Google search and it said it's not a benzo, but it works on the brain like a benzo. Is there more information about this? Can I just speak to this? Because I was put on Ambien in 2011 um, and I was given it by my doctor and, you know, I'm in recovery from substance use and, you know, I never took it more than I was supposed to. Like I never took two at night. I always took one. Um, and in 2015, I had a, a bit of a mental breakdown and I didn't understand what was going on. And the doctor who prescribed it to me looked at me and said, you know, you're not sleeping, right? And I was like, what? And he was like, no, this is a, uh, what's it called? Uh, sedative hypnotic. So you, I had not actually gotten sleep in six years and it took me I didn't sleep when I stopped taking Ambien. I didn't sleep for, I think it was 16 or 17 days. So they can tell you what they want about Ambien. I wish I had like a, you know, a, a lab where I could do the research, but I can tell you that Ambien is, it is, it comes with withdrawal and it is absolutely addicting. I can just add something quickly. Ambien's called a Z drug or a non-benzodiazepine and they do work similar, similarly to benzos. And if you look for the Ashton manual in the back, she, um, Dr. Ashton is like a renowned expert on benzos and Z drugs of which Ambien is one. If you Google for the Ashton manual, she has a section in the back um, giving you the equivalence of all of the Z drugs into Valium and teaches you also how to taper the Z drugs um, like Ambien. It's very similar to trying to get off a of benzodiazepine. Okay, um, Angie or any of the peer panelists offered to go into medical schools or psych residencies to talk with the newbie docs so they might better understand the risks associated with psych meds. Has any program said yes? Um, maybe show the film at med schools? Lynn, do you want to answer? Well, yes, we are so, we're working on that. Um, we've, we're, we've just cut a 52 minute version, which was very painful because, um, you know, to cut 76 minutes down to 52. But 52 fits into more of a uh, academic, you know, one hour time frame. And um, so far, our, we have shown the film at, at universities and it's been really, two universities, it's been really interesting. Students have a lot to say. They talk about how prevalent it is. Um, but we, that is a nut we need to crack and we want to crack and we will be doing that with the shorter version of the film. 
and uh, we did show the film to a um, a doctor who understands tapering, um, in particular benzodiazepine tapering. So he he has been uh, going around the country training other doctors, and um, so we sent him the film, which he said, "I love the film. I love ninety seven percent of it," but. Um, he had other criticisms that we're not sure that he loved 97% of it. Anyway, um, he just said, I'm not um, with, with the 3% that I don't approve of. I think you're, you don't give enough um, credence to the good impact of the drugs. And um, therefore I'm not going to show this to my, my trainees, which crushed us. And um, we're not going to give up, but I just, it's, it's going to be hard because I think asking academic institutions to show something that's not what they've been teaching is quite threatening. Even though we don't mean it to be threatening, we mean it to be educational and um, we're not gonna give up that we haven't had success thus far, but we're hopeful. But we, have, we did have a little success when uh, I showed it to 180 psychology and social work students in Missouri, St. Louis, Missouri. Um, I've done a couple with behavioral health agencies, so therapists, because therapists are with you one hour a week as opposed to like eight minutes with a psychiatrist a month. So we have cracked that nut a little bit. And uh, it would, it's surprising. Like I always, I'm always like preparing to be defensive or something, you know, <laughs> like, oh no, what are they gonna say? But most therapists have been completely open to this and they've, they've said things like, I knew it, you know, or mm -hmm. no wonder my patients aren't getting better or, sometimes I can't tell, am I talking to the patient or are they, am I talking to the side effects? Like, I don't even know what's, what's the real problem anymore. So therapists are really open and um, college students have been really open. And I mean, I think we do it in a way that it's not, like we said, we're not shaming anyone. We're just bringing up our lived experience and trying to tell our stories and just have this conversation that's not happening anywhere else. One other, I didn't want to be not I wanted I wanted to say that there was some great hope in Philadelphia in a screening we had there where a lot of UPenn researchers and scientists um, were very very open and um, spoke eloquently about the science the scientists are all beginning to understand all this and um, they were very open and each one wrote and said I would like to help get you guys into this this group so we're not not having success. It's just we aren't there yet. I guess. Um, do we want to go ahead and wrap things up? Yeah, I think everyone, do we want to go around and just have everyone say one last thing to sum up their thoughts? Who wants to go and, first? <laughs> I'll go, I'll just say that we have a YouTube channel with over 100 clips that didn't, that are supplementary material to the film. So go check us out on YouTube and then Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. We also have accounts. So just look for Medicating Normal and our website, medicatingnormal.com has tons of resources, alternatives, um, uh, the safe tapering stuff that we were talking about earlier. And then if you want to do a screening or you know anybody that does, just contact us at medicatingnormal at gmail.com. This is Bronwyn. Um, I want to thank you, Angie and Lynn and Nicole and everyone that did worked on that film. It was amazing. Um, I'm glad you're getting that the message out there. And the one thing that I would say is do the research. Do your research. Do your own research. Ask your own questions um, because you are still a human being and you still have rights. And if, and if it doesn't answer you the way you need to, you can always find another doctor. You have choices. So thank you for having me on. Yeah, I would just like to say thank you to Lynn and Angie and Nicole and everybody who participated in that film. It was amazing. And I'm looking forward to you changing the world. <laughs> Yeah, I want to also second that. Thank you so much, Lynn, uh, for the film and Nicole and Angela and all of your work on it. Um, I think for me, particularly, I've uh, 
I, on my fridge right over here, I have a, my friend Melinda who uh, struggled back and forth with benzodiazepine issues. I actually lost a job that was funded. I was running, I was working at a drop-in center in 1993, funded by SAMHSA, and I lost my job because we were calling my old psychiatrist in New York, and I he was explaining to Melinda how challenging. Uh, benzodiazepines and what it did to your coping level over a certain period of time and how challenging it was to get off those. And I was accused by the board of directors of giving medical advice, even though I was having my friend, Dr. John Shankle, talk to her. Um, so, so important to me, and people said it earlier, the whole idea of shame or med shaming or that I know what's best for you is my goal is to be a more accepting, more compassionate individual for people who are suffering and struggling with extreme states and to be a partner on the journey instead of the captain of the ship and try to, and to the best degree that I can to when people who are struggling find connections, particularly in the Northwest and in the Portland area for people who really want, have a commitment and want to move forward with this. And I also should say, I still do have some faith that through technology and, you know, hopefully 20, 30 years from now, there's medications that don't have such consequences to your neurons and your, your, uh, your kidneys and your pancreas and your liver and have efficacy with limited or no negative effects and challenges. And I think we may look back at this period of being the barbaric of like this idea of what we're saying uh, and the irresponsibility of the medical industry saying, you know, these are suited for these people because blah, blah, blah. I think it's, I think it's, it's an awful thing in the name of stilling the mind that we cripple the body. I just think that's an unacceptable trade-off as a consumer. Like, how would this work for anybody else? Like, we got to give up my body to still my mind uh, through attacking my brain with aggressive chemicals that are ping pong balls to the rest of my living system. That's not a fair trade-off. And if we were purchasing consumers, you know, I live in poverty. I'm on Medicaid and I live on disability. I don't really count in, you know, who gets a vote or who says what happens a lot of times in society. So to the degree that we can band together and I'm really, you know, I don't know her, but my friends know of her. And actually, Nicole, I want to say I was on an Inter Intercompass podcast a few weeks ago, and I think you were on there. I really, really appreciate the development of projects like that. And to the degree that I can support them with my in people in my network and make small donations, I really think that's the hope. And again, putting forward you know social justice uh, things like documentaries that affects people's conscience and their heart, and they can't go away, not changed. And what a terrific film and project this whole thing is. And Angela, your story is has so many uh, intersections between my story. You're just an amazing human. So. I hope to continue to connect with you guys on the journey. So thank you. And thank you to Bronwyn and Jessica, my local, uh, or J Bronwyn's now in Michigan, but folks I've known here locally as well. So thank you. I, I just want to thank you guys. Uh, it's been, again, we have learned so much in this conversation. And um, I mean, there's just been poetry from each one of you, my fellow panelists. Thank you so much. Um, I just, that notion of shaming and I feel, oh my gosh, I loved my, my struggling family member that inspired this whole film. I, I hope I didn't shame her, but in my exuberance in discovering everything I did, I certainly did try to convince her that there might be another path. But to her credit, um, she reduced her meds from 10 down to four. Um, she saw the film, loves the film, thinks it's a public service, but said, Lenny, that's it. I'm comfortable where I am. I am not going to reduce any more, maybe someday, but right now I'm happy. And, um, you know, I, I think that's important, but I feel so honored that she loves the film and can step out of her own situation and understand that it's important for other people. So um, when people, when we're often asked, oh, you know, will this film convince it's dangerous will it convince people who need these drugs um stop taking them and our response is well that is not our mission we want to encourage thoughtful and informed decision decision making before someone decides to take them or before someone decides to come off of them so um 
we just hope this conversation keeps going. And again, from the bottom of our hearts, we thank you guys, panelists and the viewers and all of your good questions. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And good night. Good night. Bye everybody.